I remember the first time it happened. I was playing in the living room and watching TV at the same time. He walked into the room and asked me if I wanted to play a game in the bedroom or, or stay in the living room and clean. Being the child that I was, I chose to play the game. I entered the room and he told me to sit on the bed while he continued to undress me. I knew there was something wrong, but I didn't know what. He did some unspeakable things to me. I was sexually abused when I was younger, more specifically when I was six years old up until I was 11 or 12. At the time, I didn't know what was happening to me. I was told that I was playing a game, a game that I played for almost six years until I learned that this so-called game was wrong. How many of you are willing to discuss sexual abuse or assault? If every hand is not up, then there's still work that needs to be done. Sexual abuse defined by the American Psychological Association is unwanted sexual activity with perpetrators using force, making threats, or taking advantage of victims not able to give consent. While RAIN, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network defines sexual assault as sexual contact or behavior that occurs without explicit consent of the victim. Some forms of sexual assault include attempted rape, fondling, or unwanted sexual touching, forcing a victim to perform sexual acts such as oral sex or penetrating the perpetrator's body, penetration of the victim's body, also known as rape. However, when speaking of assault, there is really only one form of it, that being the violation of a person's body. Authorities and people with little knowledge on this topic wonder why countless of statistics demonstrate only reported cases. Why aren't there more victims coming forward about their situation? Why is this an issue? The answer can be simplified into one word, fear. How can a victim come out about their experience when judgment is looming over their heads? When a victim attempts to speak about their experience, the whole idea is and concept is more than likely to be shut down. Why is this? Because the language involved is considered too vulgar, uncomfortable, and too sensitive, when reality is, Yes, that is true, but because it is all of those things and more that we should be talking about it. When the word rape is mentioned in a conversation, there's a shiver down one's spine, there's an accumulation of tears in one's eyes, and what do we do next? Without us even noticing, for some people, their bodies does the slightest movement of disagreement in which their head shakes left and right in saying no. Our bodies automatically reject the conversation be because of the discomfort of the language. This is what is considered normal, but it, it is not acceptable. I am saying this because I am a victim of the rejection. I was in the sixth grade when the topic of sexual abuse was even introduced to me. Once I knew that it was bad, I attempted to talk to someone about it, an adult actually. I was just curious as to what sexual abuse involved and my topic was dismissed. I was told that I would learn more about it later. I didn't question it any further, and at that moment I learned my lesson, that I shouldn't talk about it. It seemed like a forbidden language. By the age of 12, my body was deemed an object more than a part of my being. It was considered invaluable compared to the reputation and future of that man. The worst part is, this backlash came from my own family. Well, what was she wearing? What did she do to provoke him? She probably did provoke him. He would never do that. He was drunk and high. He didn't know any better. He's not a bad guy. Anything was said in order to keep him free of blame, and somehow I was no longer a victim, but a victimizer or a culprit who tricked that man for attention. Witnessing my family members turn their cheek to my assault and defend that man hurt me tremendously. My bad experience was overlooked because, and I quote, it was not a big deal. But that one touch left more scars on my mind than on my body. Months following, I would wake up crying from nightmares, not of my uncle, but of other older males I feared in my life. And in those nightmares, I was unable to do anything for myself. I froze the same way I did in real life. Fast forward six years, and I am now 18 still suffering from traumatic dreams. Recently, my worst nightmare has been about being kidnapped, beaten, and raped multiple times. Every detail of this horrible dream I can recollect and replay in my mind perfectly. Once again, I was unable to move, 
only able to take the pain. Although this never happened to me, it is the trauma of my own assault manifesting into the realistic and vivid fears in my mind. This is what the people on the outside fail to realize. The trauma a sexual violence victim experiences is far beyond a physical impact. The physical abuse of the body is only one portion of the impact. That pain will go away and those scars will fade, but the psychological consequences will never cease. The trauma takes a toll on the mind of a victim. According to Dan B. Allender, it takes three seconds for trauma to register in the body, meaning that one touch can and will affect more than a victim's physical state. Once the event occurs, it can take years for a victim to process what took place in that one instance. Clearly for me, six years has not been enough time. Factors surrounding the trauma include, but are not limited to, confusion, lack of trust, self-blame, societal judgment, anxiety, depression, and ultimately suicidal tendencies in no particular order. Once trauma registers in the body, the linguistic sector in the left side of the brain shuts off, making a victim physically unable to express what occurred to them at the time of the assault. This causes confusion in the victim because they are unable to process their assault or abuse, making it hard to communicate as well as causing severe distress. Victims tend to lose trust in the people around them after their bad experience. This is because, according to Rain, Approximately 93% of perpetrators are someone known to the victim. Once the trust between the victim and the abuser is broken, victims may doubt the other people in their lives. There is also an increased awareness and or fear of sexual harassment. Victims become more self-aware of the dangers they face, whether they be at home, on the sidewalk, at school, or in a public area. Self-blame is rooted from the confusion and judgment a victim encounters after their assault or abuse. Since the victim lacks understanding of what occurred to them, they may blame themselves for allowing the assault or abuse to happen. In reality, it is only fear that takes over. Society's criticism of sexual violence victims contributes largely to the distress because victims are often shamed rather than helped. This causes victims to worry because they do not want to be rejected by the people around them. So instead, they keep their experience to themselves. Carrying this heavy burden that is imprinted on their bodies, many victims show symptoms of anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. All of the factors I mentioned before can manifest into any of these last three, which alter the mental state of a victim severely. I kept quiet until I was 15, which was only possible because at the end of October of 2015, I started having flashbacks. All the memories that I had pushed to the back of my head flushed back to me at an instant. I broke down. I felt like I couldn't tell anyone about what was going on because I still had the idea encrypted in my mind that I couldn't do so. I kept quiet for a couple more months, but during that time, I started to self-harm and it got to a point where I wanted to die. I finally told my friend about what was going on and I said my goodbyes. She ended up calling my mom and telling her I needed help and if it weren't for her, I would not be here today. My mom rushed into my room and saw the cuts on my arm and took me to wash them and stop the bleeding. At the time, I still didn't even tell my mom about what happened until July of 2016 when I attempted suicide for the third time. One thing I forgot to mention is that my abuser was still in my life, seeing that he was a really close family friend, a relative even for some. When I came out to my parents about what happened, I didn't tell them who it was. A few days after my birthday of August 2016, I saw my abuser for the last time and I broke down into tears once I left the setting because I couldn't handle seeing him any longer. My mom took me the next day to the police station to file a report, and when the police officer asked me the name of my abuser, my mom heard who it was. It took everything in her power not to cry. Luckily, a year and a half after we reported it, progress has been made on the case, and my abuser is currently behind bars. Even after this grand news, I looked into how many perpetrators are convicted of their crime, and only six in every thousand reported cases are put in jail. And once again, this comes back to the fact that victims are scared and rejected when 
they attempt to talk about their experience. And to make things clear, anyone can be a victim of sexual abuse or assault, no matter the age, gender, race, ethnicity, or role in society. It is true, however, that women are more likely to experience it, seeing that one in every three women will have had an encounter with an attempted assault or be victim of it before the age of 18, while for males, this is one in every five. Once the victim has had enough, there tends to be two general options, self-harm slash suicide or speaking up. Now, why do these seem to be the only choices? Because of the negative stigma surrounded around sexual violence victims, speaking about, up about an assault or abuse leads to severe backlash from society. Sexual abuse is not accepted widely, but instead rejected for the sake of protecting youth or innocence. However, Rather than protecting us, ignoring child sexual abuse only adds to this growing problem. Children are made naive and ignorant to one of the most dangerous epidemics in our world today. The fact that it is unacceptable to bring up sexual violence in day-to-day -day conversations creates a barrier for us victims because we feel unable to express ourselves. Speaking out about this topic requires unconditional support because more than likely a victim will be rejected whether it is by strangers or their own family. This goes hand in hand with condemning, no, letting go of abusers and perpetrators. Beginning with Brock Turner, it is clear women are not treated properly in court. This young man received only three months of jail time for raping an unconscious college girl behind a dumpster. He was caught and sentenced to essentially nothing. By law, the average amount of jail time our perpetrator should receive is five years, and even then, that is not enough. In the Belfast rape trial, which was carried out for two whole years, the five rugby players accused of sexually assaulting a young woman walked away free with no consequence. Despite the confounding evidence, including a rape kit with substantial damage to the victim's body, as well as vulgarly explicit text messages between the men regarding that same night. The anonymous victim was humiliated and dehumanized by the court for speaking up about her assault, and she has not been the only one. It took over 150 victims to sentence Larry Nasser an Olympics physician accused of fondling and touching young girls inappropriately. It took over 50 victims to sentence Bill Cosby because the first victim to speak up in 2004 was not believed. Victims are constantly put in these your word against mine situations and usually they don't win. It is only until recently that some perpetrators, such as the above, have received a meaningful consequence. But tell me, what about the rest of us? Every day, victims go through silence because what is the point in speaking up? Only about 3% of cases reported end with the abuser in jail. The other 97 are free to go about their daily lives while victims are forced to live in fear and endure the trauma, which believe me, is not easy. Not sentencing perpetrators basically tells victims that their experience and the way it has affected their lives does not matter. Not only is no justice made for the victims, but by allowing abusers to roam free, we are expanding the parameters of sexual violence. There seems to be a misconception that victims report their cases for some form of attention, whether it be for fame, money, or some sort of recognition. In reality, it takes an immense courage from a victim to report their case. It is not done for attention, but instead due to constant traumatic reminders of the tragedy. They become too much to bear to the point where it should no longer be carried only by the victim. Reporting cases is done for justice because under no circumstance and under no scenario should a victim ever be at fault. No, we do not ask for it like you claim. The clothes we choose to wear, the fluids we choose to put in our bot systems, the way we walk and the way we talk do not give anyone the right to invade our personal space to invade our bodies and most importantly, forever scar our minds. We are never taught the true meaning of consent. It is believed that anything except an explicit no is consensual. However, the true definition of consent is a yes, not being intoxicated, not being unconscious, 
not a kiss, only a solid yes. These blurred lines only cause confusion in victims because they are used as tools to justify the assault or abuse. Once again, this only adds to the tearing down of a victim rather than a building up. I conducted a project during the summer with a few underclassmen. We viewed a couple films involving sexual abuse and we discussed them and how we could help someone as shown in the film. We also discussed how we could spread awareness in our school and social media. At first, no one wanted to speak a word and you could practically hear a pen drop. It was understandable seeing that they weren't accustomed to talking about the issue, but the more sessions we had, they opened up more and more, and at the end, I am confident enough to say that they left having at least a somewhat clear understanding on how grave sexual abuse is and its effects on a victim and those surrounding a victim. Still, no matter how many sessions I had with the underclassmen, I realized that no one can truly become accustomed to talking about this issue. There are many days in which I can't even bear to listen to a victim's story or even answer a question someone might ask me about sexual abuse or assault. So the question lies, where do we begin? How can we solve this? The first step is definitely knowing what we're even combating. How can we fix something if we don't even know what's broken? Victims, better said, survivors, need to feel comfortable enough to talk about what they need. You can't expect someone to come out about their story if they don't feel the support, if they don't feel that they have a net they can fall on when they talk, if they don't feel like they're going to be heard. I admit that this is no comfortable topic. Believe me, I know. I experienced this but are you willing to talk about it? Are you willing to listen? To my left, there's a portrait, the result of a project that became very important in my life. When asked to paint where their experience affected them physically, emotionally, and mentally, each victim managed to paint similar parts. Each color, pink, blue, and purple, represents one victim two which were abused and the other assaulted. Yet their handprints cover this body almost completely. The damage caused by sexual violence is traumatizing. This showcases the trauma in only three victims and included our vivid encounters of their experience. If this does not impact you, then you are part of the problem. Outsiders have no idea what goes through a victim's mind. This is only one small way of us letting you in. Victims need to be validated. It is time we normalize the right aspects of sexual violence. It is time we acknowledge the existence of these victims because no one is exempt from it. The truth is, a victim cannot overcome their trauma alone. I ask from you to stop victim blaming and start supporting. Make our society a safe place for victims of sexual violence because as of right now, this place is non-existent. We don't ask for you to question and judge our experience. We only ask for relief, relief that our abusers will no longer hurt us or anyone else, relief that our families will not judge us nor blame us, relief that our society will protect us. The trauma alone is enough reason to validate all victims, no matter the gender, no matter the race or ethnicity, and no matter the degree of the sexual act. Are you comfortable yet? Do we matter enough yet? Are we valid to you? Thank you. Thank you.